pastor of Lexwind Baptist Church in Winston-Salem. And uh, he come out of my home church, bro. Box Mountain, brother. Was, was you ever there when Brother Ernest was there? Yeah. Uh, okay, my memory's not what it used to be. Yeah, Amen. Mine either, brother. <laughs> God bless you, Brother Eric. Amen. Amen. I was doing pretty good till they handed me this mic right here. And uh, then I started getting nervous. And uh, nervous is a good thing. Nervous is a good thing. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of things we could say, you know, I'm, I'm nervous because of the company I'm in. Uh, Y'all guys have... Uh, Y'all are seasoned men. I've only been pastor in 17 years, and uh, that's not as long as some of you guys. Talk to brother over here. She'd been pastor. But anyway, I'm a little nervous, and and then and here's the thing too. God's always our company, and then have to follow brother Jesse all the time. He's always got a smile on his face. And I've always got a frown on mine, so it's not that I, I think it's just me, you know. It's not that I'm always sad, but anyway, that's just the way it is. I love the Bible. I love the Bible. I love God's people. You've been a blessing to me this week. If I was, how old are you again, young man? 16? If I could do it all over again. I got saved at 30, started preaching at 35. Brother Brian was on my ordination council. Brother Bob was on my ordination council. If I could do it all over again, up in West Virginia when I was in that youth camp and that boy standing beside of me started, got saved and started preaching, I'd have started when you started. I will give you a good piece of advice. You need a Paul. You need an Elijah. You need a Moses. Every Joshua need a Moses. Every Elisha needed Elijah. Every Timothy needs a Paul. You need a man you can follow. You need a man you can follow. I tell you. I tell you. I text one of my, well, I actually got to take a picture with my mentor last night, Preacher Baker, Roger Baker, Calvary Baptist Church for 35 years. He come to Lexwin after I was pastor, and I done everything backwards. What I'm trying to tell you, young man, I done everything backwards. I got married out of the will of God. I started having children out of the will of God. I done everything backwards. When I got saved, I was in the will of God. <laughs> but everything backwards. I started pastor and then went to Bible college. Everything I'd done was backwards. But if I'd have had a man, I may not have had to do everything backwards. So find you a man and follow that man. A good man. Roger Baker come to Lexwind Baptist Church as I was already pastoring, and he asked me, he said, he said, uh, you'd be interested in coming to Bible college? And I said, no, I don't think so. I said, I can't afford Bible college. A little church, you barely can pay me a salary. I said, I can't afford the Bible college. And he said, is that your only excuse? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, well, I'll just take care of that. He said, I'm administrator of the school. He said, I'll wipe off your bill. I'm the only person to ever go through Calvary Baptist Bible College in King, North Carolina for free. But that man invested in my life. And I was able to take a picture with him last night. And, and then I texted Pastor Broyhill this morning. And I told him, I said, I've never forgotten Calvary. The investment men has made in my life. These men right here, Brother Paul, man, he shouted, man, for years and years and years. There's old Brother Chuck back there smiling. And, uh, man, just still people pouring into my life. Find you a man to follow. Amen. Let's turn to the book of Ezra this morning. I appreciate everything I've heard this week. It's been a help to me. I'm a little mulish. No, hold, hold on, man. Let me scratch you out. I'm a whole lot mulish. I don't mean to be, but we're in flesh. I heard Oliver B. Green uh, saying our flesh just loves darkness. I heard him say that this morning coming down the road. And I don't mean to be. I don't want to be. I really don't want to be. But it just happens to be that way. And you pray for me that I'll do better. Amen. I'm still trembling. I can't. I, I have to hold on here. 
I stayed up late last night with my feet in water. Brother Robert knows what it's like. And I just, because God's burned a message in my soul for this meeting, Brother Brian kind of forewarned me that I'd be preaching this weekend. And uh, then I heard Brother Terry Lawson the other night preaching out of the book of Jeremiah. And I had two messages, and I didn't know which one to preach. And then when he preached out of the book of Jeremiah, I said, okay, that's, that's the one we'll go with. But out of the book of Ezra, we'll, we'll, it's where we'll be this morning. God will help us in a minute. We'll get straightened out. Born and raised in in a uh, little bit town in West Virginia. When you hear about Elisha being a Tishbite, who knows where that's at, you know? And uh, Bolt, West Virginia, who knows where that's at? Little Jimmy Dickens knows where that's at. That's where he was born. He never went back there, you know what I mean? But that's why I was born and raised, Bolt, West Virginia. Ain't you glad God, he, he comes to where you're at? He draws you out. He saved me when he brought me out of there. Not saved me like spiritually saved. He, he saved my life. I was 16 years old already and was drinking heavy, all kinds of stuff. But he saved me. He, he moved my daddy down to North Carolina. My mama, under the, I don't even know why my mama followed him, Brother Brian. My daddy didn't go to church, but my mama. <laughs> But it was all, it was all God working. It was all God working. <laughs> he brought me down here and uh, let me cross paths with Brother Mark Smith. Driving a truck. He invited me to Box Mountain. That's where Brother Brian's out of. That's where Brother Bob's out of. Brother Paul's out there. Hey, some good men come out there. God saved me. Man, I'm telling you. Called me to preach the same year. Put me in a pastor five years later. And he's kept me there. I don't know why he counted me faithful. Paul said he counted me faithful putting me into the ministry. He ain't just put me into the ministry. He's kept me in the ministry because I've wanted to leave a thousand times over. Amen. Anyway, I feel like preaching now. My name's Eric Goff. He, he introduced me a minute ago, but uh, I pastor a little church on the south side of Winston and uh, just trying to get people to fall in love with the Bible. Amen. I love the Bible. Amen. Amen. Let's look in Ezra chapter 1. You pray for me. God led me to preach through the book of Ezra on Sunday morning. I've only preached three sermons. It's took me three hours to preach it. And Brother Brian wants me to be done in 15 minutes. So what I'd have to do is take a deep breath <laughs> and preach fast. I can't read as much as I had been reading, but but now let me let me just explain to you. Many of you men of God know about Ezra. Ezra is a uh, a post captivity book. Uh, the nation of Israel, because of their sin, has been in captivity for seventy years, and God says enough is enough. He fulfilled His promise. He chastened them for a while. And now he's going to bless them by bringing them back to the homeland, which is always a blessing. I'm glad that God will chasten us, but I'm also glad God will wrap us up in his arms and love us. Amen. And so Ezra is a post-captivity book, and it covers a, 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 spirit, a, a period of time where it, it talks about a little bit about Zerubbabel and then Ezra, and then later on, of course, the Nehemiah as well. But I want to read you a few notes here that... Uh, uh, Schofield put here in, in the, because I just fell in love with the book of Ezra when, when I began to read these notes and then, and then started reading in the book of Ezra. But here's what Schofield said. He said, Ezra followed and restored the law and ritual. Notice this, but the mass of the nation, the most of the princes remained by preference in Babylon. Ain't that a sad, sad statement? I mean, these people had tasted of the good grace of God instead of returning they decided they'd stay. That's sad that anybody would want to live outside of where God wanted them to be. That's a very sad place to be. 
And it says here, he goes on and says this, and, and uh, he said, uh, where they were prospering. Why did they stay there? Because they were prospering. God was even blessing them in Babylon, but they decided to stay there. They didn't want to go back to Jerusalem. They didn't want to help out do the hard work. Amen. Notice this. It says the post-captivity books deal with that feeble remnant. And that's kind of what this reminds me of this morning. Now, I'd really honestly like to see the church packed out. I know Brother Brian would as well. I'd like to see our church packed out. Okay, and I'm sure you'd like to see your church packed out. And if it is packed out, you need to praise God for that. Amen. But notice this right here. It says that uh, this book deals with a feeble remnant. Notice this right here. Which alone had a heart for God. So, in other words, what I'm trying to say is it don't take a big crowd of people to do a great work for God if they have a heart for God. Amen. And so let's look at this uh, first five verses and then I'll try my best to uh, uh, give you this three hour sermon in, in 20 minutes. Amen. The Bible says here in verse number one, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all of his kingdom and put it also in writing, and thus Cyrus, uh, saying this, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia. Notice this right here. The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Now go, th go figure. Who is there? Notice what Cyrus says after he made this proclamation. Then he says, who is there among you of all of his people? His God be with him. And let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God which is in Jerusalem. And whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth, let the men of his place help him with silver, with gold, with goods, and with beasts, besides the free will offering for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. And then rose up the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites, with all them, notice this right here, whose spirit God had raised to go up to build the house of the Lord which is in Jerusalem. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to stand here. And uh, Lord, I thank you for the tears. I thank you, Lord, for the nervousness. Lord, you've helped me this morning already. Thank you for this young man. My prayer, Lord, is he'll just find him a, uh, an Elijah or, or a Paul or a Moses. And God, that he will follow you all the days of his life. Lord, put a hedge about him and God and protect him. And, and Lord, provide for him. God, will praise you and thank you for that. Bless these other men of God, Lord, who have stood the test of time. God, I thank you for them and what they've given us this week. I pray your blessings, uh, Lord, on this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, I wrote in the heading of my Bible, and this is what I've been preaching on at our church on Sunday morning, and I wrote these words here. It's been 70 years, and that's long enough. And then I wrote these words, getting back to God. If there's ever a day that we need to get back to God, it's today. Amen. I understand where the context of this scripture is. I understand that we're in the Old Testament. I understand that we're, we're post-captivity. I understand the history of Israel. I don't have time to give you a history lesson. Most of you should already know the history lesson uh, of the nation of Israel. But I want us to look at this and, and look at some things in the Bible here this morning. And I want us to see how they got themselves back to God and how we can take that and apply it to our life and we can get ourselves back to God. Amen. Amen. Now, if you would, you help me pray because i got to preach fast. Now, I want to say this before we get into the, the different points of the message. But according to the scripture here in verse number 1, we see that Jeremiah's prophecy had been fulfilled. Ain't you glad God keeps his promises? Amen. God keeps his promises. God keeps his promises. If you do right, he'll bless you. If you do wrong, he'll whip you. Amen. And if you'll read 2 Chronicles, I don't have time to read it, but if you'll read 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verses 12 through 22, you'll see that God said this, if my people, watch this right here, if they do wrong, I'm going to get them out of the land. I'm going to tear down their temple that Solomon had just built. And guess what? They did wrong and he did what he told them he was going to do. 
And let me say this, if we do wrong today, he'll do the same thing for us. You say, preacher, how do you know that? Because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if he'll whip Israel, he'll whip the church. Amen. Amen. By the way, the Bible says judgment must first begin at the house of God. We shouldn't, has anybody here volunteered for a whipping? I know when my mom, somebody was talking about a hickory stick yesterday. Hey, my mama didn't use hickories. She used forsythia bushes, amen. That's in big old long green bushes. And, hey, they bloom you out in the summertime or the spring. I'm going to tell you something. They make good switches. Amen. Are you volunteering for a whipping? No, nobody in their right mind wants a whipping. Listen, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 5 and 6, My son, despise thou not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth his son, uh, whom he receiveth. Amen. Hey, listen, God will keep his promises. He'll either bless you or he will whip you. So don't ever forget that. Amen. Now, let's look here quickly. I'm going to turn page. I've got a stack of notes, but I want to turn quickly and I'm going to get right into the message and just give you the points and uh, try to be a blessing to you. How did Israel, how did Judah and Benjamin, those two tribes, how did they get the nation of Israel back to God? First of all, we see right here, according to the scripture, uh, that Jeremiah's prophecy was fulfilled. Now let me say this, here's the first way, the first thing we must do that they did that will help us get back to God. And it's this, you just sung about it, Brother Jesse, it's just right here. They trusted the word of God. Hey, listen to me, church. If we're going to get, hey, pastors, listen to me. If we're going to get our churches back to God, we must first. It begins with the fathers. It begins with the pastors and the preachers. And if we're going to get our people to God, we got to trust the Word of God. Amen. Amen. That word fulfilled means to be accomplished or performed. Hey, listen, it means to be completed or executed. God had done everything he said he would do. And since he is the same today, we can trust the word of God to get ourselves and our people, our families and our home and our churches and our community, we can get them back to God. Now listen, here's the thing. I'm going to give you several reasons why we can trust the word of God. First of all, we see it there in that first verse. Because the word of God is prophetical. You say, what does that mean? Everything it said about the past, the present, or the future is true. Amen. And you can trust it because it's true. It's prophetical. It's powerful. Hebrews 4.12 said the, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joint and marrows and discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Hey, it's prophetical. It's powerful. It's preserved. Psalm 118.89 Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Hey, you can trust the word of God. Hey, it's pure. Psalms 12 and verse 6 The words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times the word is promising hey watch this right here in 2 Corinthians 1 and 20 for all the promises of God in him who's that Jesus Christ are yea and in him amen under the glory of God by us amen Jesus is the word of God and every promise in him God says is yea hey and if it's yea we can get our churches back to God John 14 and verse 13, our little bitty old church on the south side, we just bought a $184,000 house with zero money. We're paying $5,166 a month and, 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 and some change for a house payment. And before we ever launched out to pay for this house, owner financing, in two years we're going to pay for it. And the way we did it is we did it on the Word of God. John 14 and verse number 13. Jesus said, whatsoever you ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. He said, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. Amen. Let me share something with you. If you'll put your trust in the Word of God, you can get your people back to God. Amen. Let me give you several examples. I'm reading fast. I'm preaching fast, Brother Brian. Noah trusted the Word of God. In Genesis 6, he found God's Word was trustworthy. When he built the ark and God saved his family, just like he said. 
In, a, in Genesis 12 and 1 through 4, Abram, he left everything he knew in the earth of the Chaldees because he believed the promises of God. And we know the story, the end of the story for Abraham's life. His children are as the stars of the sky in heaven and for multitude and as the sand is upon the seashore. Even when he couldn't have children, the Bible said he believed God. Amen. It was Moses in Exodus 14 and verse number 13. He's looking at an impossibility. And, and listen here, he called out to God. He said, what are we going to do now? We got all these million Jews and then we got all them, them, uh, uh, them Egyptians coming up behind us. Mountains on both sides and the sea in front of us. It's an impossibility. And God said, go ahead, go forward, amen. And he trusted the word of God and the sea was divided. And the very sea that God divided to make a way for his children, he used it to destroy the enemy, amen. Amen. It was Peter in Matthew 14, verse 28, 29, who stepped out on one word. See, it don't take a whole lot of God's word to get a work done. Listen here, I'm trying my best this morning to breathe hope into you. Because I believe sometimes when we see our churches get away from God, we lose hope. Some of you, where's that little girl that sings about your faces are really showing it? Some of you, you're on your face. It looks like you've lost hope. Hey, but I'm telling you, hey, hope, hope is in the word of God. Help is in the word of God. And when Peter said, Lord, if it be thou, bitch me to come unto thee, Jesus responded with one word, and he put his faith in one word, and Peter walked on water. And let me share something with you. Hey, we can do the same if we'll trust the word of God. Trust the word of God. That's the first thing they did. They trusted the word of God. They looked around, Brother Brian, and here's what they said. Uh, said, since Jeremiah's prophecies come true, hey, we, it must be true that we can trust God's word. Amen. You'll never find a lie in the word of God. But not only do we trust the word of God, but we've got to trust the workings of God. Amen. Romans 8, 28 said, we know that all things. How'd I get here, man? How'd I get here? Because he's worked it out. Amen. How do I get out of West Virginia? Get out of all that mess because he worked it out. Amen. Hey, by the way, that's how you got here. He's worked it out. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To them are they called according to his purpose. We know this right here. He's worked it out. And we look at that in verse number two. And we look at that in verse number three. How did he work it out? Let's look at the ways he worked it out. He charged Cyrus the king to build him a house. Hey, listen here. When we don't think God's in control of government, let me remind you, God's in control of government. Amen. Hey, listen here. I'll vote Republican in November. Whether he gets in or she gets in, I promise you God's still in control. Amen. And you know what? Watch this right here. Whether Cyrus is king or whether somebody else is king, somebody worse than him or better than him, can I tell you there's still hope to get back to God. Amen. He charged Cyrus. I don't have time to read all this stuff. He charged Cyrus the king. But then he challenged the Lord's people. You'll read that down there in verse number 3. Watch what Cyrus says. He said, if God wants me to build a house... The only one I should ask to help build the house of God is the people of God. Don't die on me. I'm apt to listen here. I'm apt to come off this platform, sit in your lap if you die on me. Don't die on me. Listen here. Hey, you die on me. You're dying on God. Hey, listen. It ain't the world's job to get the church back to God. It's the people of God's job to get the church back to God. Amen. Hey, there was a challenge to the people of God. That's how God works it out. We see right yonder, he stirred in people's hearts. He stirred in their heart. Amen. There was a challenge to God's people. Then there was also compensation for the work of God. God even worked that out. Hey, listen here. Before we bought that house, Brother Gary, two years or a year and a half ago, we ain't quite got it paid for yet. Do you know God already knew how he's going to pay for that house? You know why? Because he compensates his work. In other words, God's not going to guide you where God won't provide for you. Amen. Hey, we don't need to lose hope. We don't need to say hey, we can't get the church back to God. Hey, we can get the church. You say, preacher, it costs too much. Hey, Jesus paid it all. Amen. He compensates for his work. 
by the way, you say, how did he compensate for it? First of all, he told everybody who wanted to lay around in their prosperity that they needed to take care of everybody that was going back to Jerusalem. And then when Cyrus saw all that going on, he said, let me get in on action because I want God's blessings too. Hey, God controls the finances of this world. Amen. Amen. The heart of the king is in the Lord's hands. Amen. And if there's a, I tell our church this all the time, I said, if there's a rich man in Charlotte, North Carolina, and God wants his money in my bank account, he'll make sure it gets there. Amen. One of our house payments come due several months ago on the last day. I mean, it was about $2,000 short. And I was sitting at the house praying and fasting. And I was stretched over my Bible and my phone rung. It was a guy out of Georgia. I'd worked with him in Idaho on building a preacher's house out there, Brother Matthew Beavers. And Brother Wayne called. He said, uh, how you doing, preacher? And he was talking about this and that. He said, oh. And I told him what was going on. He said, oh, now I know why God had me call you. He said, how much you need? I told him, he said, checks in the mail. Yes, sir. Amen. He's a rich man down in Georgia. By the way, I'm going to say this. God compensates his work. Yes. Amen. Yes. Then, and number four, the workings of God. Watch this right here. He compensates his work, but he also convicts the heads of the people to get back to work. In conviction, we see verse number five. God raised them up, those, those, those fathers, those chief fathers, Hey, let me say this right here. Hey, what we need today is God to stir up from the top to the bottom. Hey, it's the preacher's job. Amen. It's the preacher's job to get stirred up to get the church back to God. Let me give you one more final point and I'll be done. Again, I, I've skipped so much of this stuff. I, I, I really don't know where I'm at now. But watch this right here. So we must trust the word of God. We must watch this right here. We must trust the workings of God. Can I say this right here? Listen to me. We must be trusted workers of God. I'm going to give you a sobering question. Now, the Apostle Paul, I said this earlier. The Apostle Paul said that the Lord counted him faithful, putting him in the ministry. In the foreknowledge of God, God knew that he could trust the Apostle Paul. You believe that? Before you come here, he knew he could trust you with this church. Before he sent me to Lexwin, he knew that he could trust me with Lexwin. I didn't think he could trust me with anything. I don't know why he trusts me with anything. But God knows the future from the past. Now, let me ask you a question. Here's a sobering question. Can you be trusted to do the work of God? Can God trust you? To do the work of God. Can God trust you to get his people back to him? That's a sobering question. These people, I'm going to give you these quickly now and I'm done. These people in this passage, these chief men. I'm going to say this. You, you're, you'll not be able to write it down for, for, for because I'm going to say it so fast. But these people were selected people. You know why they were selected? That word selected means choice. You know why they were choice people? It's because they chose to follow God. You see, that chosen generation, according to 1 Peter chapter number 2, that says you're a chosen generation, you're a royal peace. Hey, you didn't become chosen until you chose. Amen. You mean, many, many are called, but few are chosen. You know who the ones got chosen was? The one who chose him. It was a whosoever will salvation. This was a whosoever will proclamation. Some of y'all looking at me like I'm real strange, but I'm still in the book. I'm still in the book. This was a whosoever will proclamation. You say, Preacher, where you get that at? Who is there among God's people? It was a whosoever proclamation, but only a select few chose to go back. And those were the one God said, this is my choice vessel. These people were a selected group. They were a stirred group. Hey, listen, you'll never get your church back to God if you ain't stirred up about getting back to God. You got to get stirred up about getting back to God. Amen. I bless the Lord that he's letting me go through the book of Ezra. Amen. By the way, our church is celebrating its 70th homecoming Sunday. 
Ain't it amazing how God works, Brother Gary? 70 years in captivity. We're finishing up 70 years. I told our church the other day, based on the authority of God's word, we're fixing to go into the best years of our church's existence. If you don't get stirred up about it, they ain't going to get stirred up about it. Amen. They were stirred people. Brother Paul, you've always been stirred up about it. Amen. Amen. Watch this. They were strengthened people. How did they get strengthened? Verse 6, by everybody else that didn't go because they were required to give to the ones that were going. They were separated people. You say, what do you mean they were separated? They turned their back on their prosperity and went back into Jerusalem. Hey, watch this right here. Where things wasn't so glamorous, they went back because they wanted to get back to God. They separated themselves. It's going to take some separation in these days to get our church back to God. They were sacrificial people. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, over in chapter 2, verse 68, they offered freely. You say, what's that mean? Spontaneously. Nobody had to, ask, nobody had to put an offering plate in front of them. They brought their offering to the plate. The kind of people we're hunting for right there, ain't it, Brother Paul? Hey, we don't want to guilt you to give. Hey, you ought to be glad to give, amen. Hey, God loving a cheerful giver, amen. When we bought that house over there, we took house pledges, Brother Brian. We took pledges, and we said, don't take away from your tithing. Don't take away from your missions given. We want you to sacrifice and give above that. Every husband, every wife that's working a job, we need 250 out of you, 250 out of you. We need an extra $500 a couple out of your home. And guess what? They're giving it. Why? Because they're sacrificial people, amen. That's the kind of people that's going to get their church back to God. They were settled people. You say, what's that mean? Well, they dwelt in their cities. They were sojourners in, in Babylon, but they were going up here to stay. They dwelt there. They went back to stay, no matter the cost. Hey, listen here. They was a desolate place, but they went determined. And then last of all, this young man, where'd he go? He didn't come back today. Who preached yesterday morning? That young man didn't come back, did he? I want you to know I heard what he said. We need to be serious. You know why we need to be serious for young men like that over there? We need to be serious about getting our church back to God. And just like this young man that preached yesterday from Greenville, watch this right here. If we're not serious about getting our church back, uh, Brother Gary, our age, 50, how old are you, brother? 34, 40. If we're, not, if we're not serious about getting our churches back to God, you might, as well, you might as well chalk them off over there. They don't have no hope. Amen. What they do, I'm finished. What they do, they trusted the word of God. That's where it starts. That's where it starts. That's where it starts. Before we bought that house, I prayed and fasted for two straight weeks. And I said, God, give me a word. If you give me a word, I'll go. He gave me two verses. We bought the house. Now watch this right here. It starts with trusting the word. Secondly, secondly, watch this right here. We've got to trust the workings of God. You said, preacher, what's that mean? Whatever God says. Do it. You don't have to understand it. Just do it. And then thirdly, be, be trusted workers of God. Allow God to put his confidence in you. And if you do, where you're at, you will help get your church and those people back to God. Amen.